Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the December 1st meeting of the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. It's wonderful to see all of you today. I'd ask that you please rise as the Midland County Sheriff's Department presents the colors. Commissioner Burris will be leading us in the pledge this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Commission Whitaker. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for the opportunity to not only serve you, but to serve the great state of Texas. And Lord, I pray that you uh, continue to be with those law enforcement officers out there who are working, doing the very best that they can do. Be with us today as we make some decisions. Let those decisions uh, be in your honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. As I said, we had the Midland County, we were blessed to have the Midland County Sheriff's Department color guard here. Uh, we wanted to thank Sergeant Samuel Garces, Deputy Thomas Navarrete, Deputy Britt Krevit, Officer Jason Ward, and Officer Jonathan Serrano. Would you please give them a round of applause? Great job. <laughs> we very much thank you for for blessing us with your presence this morning. Thank you, gentlemen. So, Ms. Jackson, would you do roll call, please? Commissioner Kim Lebeau. Here. Commissioner Jason Hester. Commissioner Patricia Burris. Here. Commissioner Ron Hood. Here. Commissioner Sharon Thomas. Commissioner Kim Whitaker. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Jana Atkins. Here. Excellent, thank you very much. I wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of you for being here. We have a, a great audience this morning and want to, we also appreciate those of you that are joining us um, online. It's great to be back at the Pickle Center. We want to uh, uh, recognize and thank the University of Texas at Austin for hosting us. So I think we all had a moment uh, of feeling a little surreal walking, uh, walking in this morning and realizing that we hadn't been here um, in almost two years. So appreciate everyone being here this morning. <clears throat> We're gonna move to agenda item number two, which is the approval of the minutes of the September 2nd quarterly commission meeting. Do we have a motion? I make a motion. To accept Second. the minutes. <laughs> well, we have we have some firsts and we have some seconds. So, <laughs> all those in favor? <laughs> pardon me. 
Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> so the motion passes, and we are going to go a little bit out of order today. So we are going to skip to agenda item number five, which is discuss and take action on the request for waiver of TCO Rule 217.1, the minimum standards for enrollment and, in, and initial licensure. Director Vickers. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. It's nice to be here with you again. Um, first up for you, we have a request from the Taylor County Sheriff, Ricky Bishop, uh, asking for a Class A waiver on behalf of Anthony R. Culpepper. Our staff has, we did our investigation of this request and reviewed it, and we felt like it was uh, something needed to come before your attention, so we're bringing it to you this morning for your consideration. And I believe that we have um, Sheriff Bishop and Mr. Culpepper here. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, we appreci appreciate the opportunity. Um, I've known Mr. Culpepper for probably between 10 and 12 years. I've been trying to get him to come work for me in some form or fashion for a while, and I finally convinced him to do that. Um, and in looking in into his background, there's a little hiccup there. Um, at, with all the uh, investigation that we have done, um, I felt like this uh, hiccup that he had, uh, the 2005, 2006 area, um, probably should have been a learning experience for him instead of uh, being arrested for it. And uh, I believe he's going to be a great asset for uh, Taylor County Sheriff's Office uh, with his worth ethic, worth ethic. And um, I think he's, he will eventually be a leader in our agency, and I would just ask that y'all approve this waiver for him. Mr. Culpepper, would you like to address the commission? I'd just like to say, I, like like Mr. or Sheriff Bishop said, I, I think it could have been handled differently on both parts. Um, I don't regret the day. I mean, it, it was a learning experience. Um, you know, we're all young once and you know, made a mistake, did something, you know, I didn't know, I, I, I didn't know what they claimed was a weapon was, was a weapon. Um, and I just appreciate your time and, and consideration for this. Uh, it means a lot to me. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has for me about any of the, the statement that I made. Questions? What type of weapon are we talking about? They claimed it as a, a baton. It was a, a tire knocker that I used, like you could purchase at a truck stop. I pulled some tandem maxwell trailers, did a lot of uh, work on the weekends and stuff, pulling trailers, hauling tractors and hay and stuff. Um, it was something I never even purchased. Someone had left it in my pickup, it was underneath the passenger seat. Um, they had asked for consent to search. I gave them consent to search. In my mind, I had nothing that I wasn't supposed to have. Um, you know, we're all taught, you know, you're not supposed to have marijuana, you're not supposed to have legal drugs. I mean, I knew I couldn't have a handgun, but I didn't know that this was something that I wasn't supposed to have. Uh, like I said in my statement, uh, it was not a weapon to me. It was a tool. Um, it was something that I never had any intention of using it as a weapon, never would have used it as a weapon, uh, had no prior criminal history or anything like that, not violent or anything like that. Okay, and this baton, what type of work were you doing at the time? Like I said, I, I did construction work, but I would also do a lot of side work for a friend of mine's father, and I pulled a trailer, like a gooseneck trailer, hauling hay and different tractors and stuff like that, and I used it as its intention to me was a, a tire knocker to check air pressure and tire. And how old were you at the time of the rest? I was 20. I worked a full-time job six, seven days a week. Uh, I lived on my own at the time, was not into my roof of my parents. I worked every bit of hours I could work just to pay my bills and make ends meet. You know, you know I was not a, a, a criminal by any means. I can assure you. Any other questions? Okay. Do we have a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the waiver for Mr. Culpepper. Okay. I'll second. I'll second. We I'll have second. A, we have a motion and a second. Did you catch the second? Okay. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Time. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. And thank you for your interest in and willingness to serve the citizens of Texas. We have high hopes and expectations of you, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. Commissioners, next up, um, the chief from the Friendswood Police Department has come before you and uh, sent to us a request for a Class A waiver on behalf of David W. Hardy. Uh, we have reviewed this and done our investigation on it and felt like it was something that needed to come before you for your consideration. So we bring that to you now. Okay. Good morning, Chief and Mr. Hardy. Oh, I'm assuming that you would like to talk with and address the commission. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address the uh, commission this morning. Now, I really come uh, to you this morning by a different uh, path than in uh, many of the law enforcement people in this room. I spent uh, 24 years on active duty, three years as a uh, enlisted uh, man in the Army, and then another 21 years as a uh, Marine infantry officer. So our applicant today has many data points in his past in his history as we did his criminal you know background investigation that i can relate to you know in my own enlisted experience and then in my commissioned experience leading people like david hardy so uh, in his packet there's a copy of his dd214 now david had two dwis before he went into the army david is a man who's lost everything and he is a man who went ahead and recovered from that and has been able to turn his life around in the last 14 years. Served six years on active duty in the United States Army. Of those uh, three or six years in the United States Army, he deployed for three years, twice to Afghanistan and once to Af uh, twice to uh, Iraq and once to Afghanistan. You know, he's uh, received numerous unit awards, but most noteworthy when I looked at his uh, discharge, his DD-214, was the fact that he had been awarded four Army Commendation Medals and one Army Achievement Medal. For an individual who probably went over as a young uh, infantryman, uh, E-1 or E-2, when he first deployed, you know, over time he deployed as an NCO and then ultimately as a team leader. This is a man who's seen combat. This is a man who uh, you know, got a second chance in life from the United States Army. Uh, he's been employed in South Carolina for the last four years as a deputy. He's proven himself there, has promoted. And uh, you know, this is the first time I've been in to this uh, forum and asked for a waiver. And Friendswood PD is not hurting for bodies. But this is a gentleman who will bring something to the table. He is certainly seasoned. He's got a lot of life experience. And for all the young officers I have, I think he'll go ahead and uh, you know, provide some great peer mentoring and some great peer leadership uh, you know, as a member of the Friendswood Police Department. Mr. Hardy, would you like to address the commission? Good morning. Um, uh, something I told them, many other people, my current agency in South Carolina and the municipal agency I worked at before that, I'd like to tell you all, there's no excuse for anything in my past, and it was my responsibility and my bad decisions. Uh, so I'm not here for that. But I'm a 42-year-old man who's seen quite a bit. I have a wife, a three-year-old daughter, a lot of responsibility I didn't have back then. Um, I did lose everything. I paid for it. I continue to pay for it. And that's, that's my burden to bear. I earned that. Um, I work at a 200-man agency, and I'm a night shift corporal at that agency. Uh, I made that under a year and a half. I work very hard. I make mistakes. I have in my past. That's why we're here today. I have on the job. 
I never made the same one twice on the job in the Army or, or this, this law enforcement career I have now. Um, but I've learned to be a leader and a follower. I, 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 I know what the law says and I know what right is. I want to be a contributing member to the community. I, we, we were trying to live in Friendswood, not just work there. Uh, so having lost everything, I worked hard to get where I am today. And all I could do is be humble for y'all and say, I'm ready to work for this state, for this, for this town, for this chief, and for my family. Uh, I humbly ask for the opportunity to do so. Thank you. And commissioners, any questions? I didn't have a question, but I, I do have a comment to make. And this is um, with respect to Mr. Culpepper and you as well. Um, it may seem like we haven't really thought about things if you don't hear a lot of discussion from us up here. And I, I would like to let you individually know, but everyone know that we have about a, today, uh, about a 200 page packet that we review prior to coming here. And about 150 of those pages are all the materials that you submitted. Now you don't hear a lot of questions from us because we've, we've read your materials um, beforehand, obviously, to be prepared to be here today. And uh, we really appreciate your letters, the time both of both you, Mr. Culpepper and Hardy, put into your statement as well. We don't always receive that. We don't always get something that's so um, detailed and um, heartfelt. So I want to commend both of you for really taking the time to express yourselves in, in a great way to us. And I, I want you to know that we appreciate it and we've we've read it. And um, so. Really, if you haven't heard a lot of discussion from us, that, that's why. You, you, and to the um, chief and sheriff, you put a, a great deal of work into your packets as well. And, and that's probably also why you're not hearing a ton of discussion from us, because it's very thorough um, and your work is very well done. And we appreciate that. Well, I brought his background investigation just in case we had to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Better to be over prepared. <laughs> well, I could. Commissioner Burris, I think your your words were uh, incredibly heartfelt and, and probably represent uh, all of us here. So thank you so much for uh, for your comments. Any other comments, <coughs> discussion, questions? Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the waiver of um, Mr. David Hardy. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, <coughs> same sign. Motion passes. Thank you so much Thank you. for taking the time to be here today. Uh, congratulations. Um, as we told Mr. Culpepper, um, we hope that you have a, a long and successful career. Appreciate you having the desire to serve the citizens of Texas and um, we'll look to hear great things about you uh, in your career here. This is a call and I'll change you my duty. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for your service to our country. Yes. Okay, we are now going to move back to agenda item number three, which is receive reports. And let me talk for just a second before uh, I pass it on to you, uh, Executive Director. Um, I've had several questions about what is, you know, what are we doing next year? What does next year look like? So um, we've been working real closely together, uh, staff and the commissioners, and we have um, collectively made the decision that we would like to uh, enhance our communication and connectivity with many of the folks that we serve. So we will be moving in 2022 to six meetings. Uh, they will be in even numbered months, uh, beginning in February. Uh, the February meeting will be here. We do not have exact dates uh, for any of the meetings as we're still working through the logistics uh, of where to meet. COVID still presents um, 
some challenges for uh, meeting locations and space, um, but we should have that posted shortly um, with the dates and location. So um, I know that there's been, been a lot of questions about that. We will get that up as quickly as possible. I do appreciate your patience. Um, as we've uh, as we continue our uh, conversation and dialogue um, on what 2022 looks like. So I've had a couple people say, so oh, we're doing that permanently. Well, I think what we'll do in 2022 is, is evaluate that uh, probably about mid-year, uh, take a look at it. Is it working? Is it not? Uh, do we need to tweak it or not? Or is it something where we you know, make changes for 2023? But um, we are going to, to try this. Uh, see how it works and uh, like I said evaluate it and then make decisions uh, hopefully mid-year or so for 2023 so um, I will kind of give a little teaser here we have made the decision to do a commission meeting during the conference and hopefully we will have a conference in 2022 I think we've all missed uh, missed getting together and there's so many of you that uh, take the time to uh, to come down and and be there. So um, you know, we will have a commission meeting. Uh, I've had questions about that and we'll have to look at the schedule for the conference and determine where it fits into the conference uh, the best. Um, uh, but that'll be out shortly. So Executive Director Vickers. Chief Lamo. Thank oh, you I'm very sorry. much. Yes. I'm sorry. I have something really quickly. Um, are you okay with taking um, item number four? Is that's the last action item we have on the agenda before we go over the report? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, little change of plans. We are going to, we will move to uh, agenda item four, which is take action to enroll and induct officers in the Texas Peace Officers Memorial Monument, um, Director Grigsby. Good morning, commissioners. I have before you uh, 67 names that are being nominated for the Texas Peace Officers Memorial Monument. Uh, those are, uh, I believe 54 of them are 2020 and 2021 deaths that have been approved by the Texas Peace Officers Memorial Ceremony Committee and or the employees retirement system of Texas that reviews medical deaths, um, as well as some historical names that have been reviewed by that committee uh, and are before you today. Uh, bear with me, I know that's a long list, but I would like to read them into the record. First, we have Corrections Officer Thomas Ogonbire from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, Sergeant Dale Moulter, Travis County Constable's Office, uh, Juvenile Corrections Officer Sean Wilson, Texas Juvenile Justice Department. Parole Officer Joseph Lang, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Corrections Officer Kenneth Harbin, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Lieutenant Bobby Almaguer, Corpus Christi International Airport Department of Public Safety. Border Patrol Agent Enrique Rositas, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Officer Roel de la Fuente, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Border Patrol Agent Agustin Aguilar, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Corrections Officer Eric Johnson, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Border Patrol Agent Marco Gonzalez, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Corrections Officer Leboath Boa, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Corrections Officer Herbert Garcia, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Officer Lucas Saucedo, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Police Officer Jorge Cabrera, Mission Police Department. Corporal Charles Holt, Tarrant County Sheriff's Office. Corrections Officer Susan Roberts, Williamson County Sheriff's Office. Deputy Sheriff Christopher Smith, McLennan County Sheriff's Office. Police Officer Jose Antonio Busso, Alamo College's Police Department. Corrections Officer Donald Parker, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Police Recruit Philip Sockwell, Plano Police Department. <coughs> Officer Domingo Hasso, Jr., excuse me, the third, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Corrections Officer Roderick Rogers, 
Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Air Interdiction Agent Christopher Carney, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Detention Officer uh, Joseph Kien, Collin County Sheriff's Office. Officer Jose Santana, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Officer Richard Rios, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Corrections Officer Timothy Beggs, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Officer Andrew Bouchard, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Sergeant David Schmidt, Seagoville Police Department. Corrections Officer Philip Holbert, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Parole Officer Brenda Lafaso, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Officer Troy Adkins, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. <coughs> Sergeant Randall Sims, <coughs> Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Lieutenant Treva <coughs> Preston, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Special Agent Robert Mayer, Jr., U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Police Officer Mitchell Penton, Dallas Police Department. Major Esteban Ramirez, Bell County Sheriff's Office. Officer Carlos Mendoza, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Corrections Officer Luis Hernandez, Sr., Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Trooper Chad Walker, Texas Department of Public Safety. Border Patrol Agent Freddy Vasquez, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Deputy Sheriff Stephen Jones, Concho County Sheriff's Office. Deputy Sheriff Samuel Leonard, Concho County Sheriff's Office. Border Patrol Agent Juan Urrutia, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Sergeant Joshua Bartlett, Lubbock County Sheriff's Office. Border Patrol Agent Edgardo Acosta Feliciano, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Police Officer Louis Trailer, Austin Police Department. Border Patrol Agent Ricardo Zarate, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Senior Police Officer William Jeffrey, Houston Police Department. Deputy Constable Kareem Atkins, Harris County Constable's Office, Precinct 4. Senior Patrolman Sherman Bennis, Kingsville Police Department. And the historical names are Private Joseph Anderson, Texas Rangers. Private John Crane, Texas Rangers. Private Henry Croson, Texas Rangers. Private Henry Rogers, Texas Rangers. Private John Ewing, Texas Rangers. Private George Martin, Texas Rangers. Private John Lynch, Texas Rangers. Captain John Denton, Texas Rangers. Private Wade Rattan, Texas Rangers. Private John Reed, Texas Rangers. Private Henry Willis, Texas Rangers. Patrolman Solomon White, San Antonio Police Department. Deputy Sheriff Thallis Cook, Brewster County Sheriff's Office. City Marshal James Jett, Orange Police Department. And Sergeant Game Warden Joy, excuse me, James Birmingham, Fort Worth Police Department. Well, I think we can all agree that we have lost too many. Um, any questions or comments or discussion from any of the commissioners? I'd like to make a motion to enroll and induct the officers as read into the record by um, Ms. Grisby uh, into the Texas Peace Officers Memorial Monument. Cool. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second it. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Okay. So we will go back to agenda item number three, Executive Director Vickers. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Commissioners, uh, from our report, the, the TECL data report, a very lengthy document. We're providing you trying to, to do a better job of that, and, and you should have it in your packet. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you have on that. I wanted to have two or three items I want to talk about, try to do very briefly. Uh, first is racial profiling. That time is coming. Um, where every agency in the state needs to do racial, their racial profiling report. 
Uh, I need to take a moment and brag on our IT division and uh, highlight something they're doing that will help agencies across the state. Uh, you may recall that we had some trouble last no, time. I'm going to interrupt sorry. you for just a yes. moment. Y'all need to be paying attention to this. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to like part this. Of, I Y'all are going to like this. I think there's going to be a lot of interest, and uh, I'm going to challenge uh, those of you in the room that you please take this information back to your agency if you are not the head of your agency. So I'm sorry yes, for the interruption, Yes, ma'am. Thank sir. you. I appreciate you making that point. Uh, you may recall that we had an issue that came up during the last uh, the, the, the last racial profiling reporting period where it was discovered that multiple agencies had not submitted a comparative analysis with a report as required by law. We got that rectified and we worked through that. Um, but it was, it was problematic because uh, not everybody understood exactly what was needed for the comparative analysis and, and so we tried to help by putting a fill in the blank analysis instrument to help them fulfill their obligation. Even then it had a lot of redundancy to it and, and so IT came to uh, their director and then to me and said, well, we, we, we've done something here I think will help. Um, for this upcoming reporting period, the IT <laughs> Uh, division has reworked this system where agencies, when they do fill in their numbers for their racial profiling, will have the option of choosing to let our system create their comparative analysis for them and include it with the final report. So uh, if they, they, will, they will have the choice. If, if it's an agency that, that does hire uh, someone to come in and do that report for them, that is still welcome and, and there'll be a system through that process where you can upload that to the system. But um, we, we took it on ourselves uh, to, to modify the system and set it up where we will do the comparative analysis for them if they check a box and say that's what I'd like us to do. It will prepare it and have it ready for the report so that, that uh, chief administrators will not have to, to do that separate document. Um, we're excited, very excited. I'm proud of my IT division for doing this. Uh, I think they did, they did, came up with this on their own. It greatly helps agencies around the state fulfill their requirement, and uh, I'm just very appreciative for the work done, done by my staff to help make that possible. They already have it working. They already had it working before they came to me. They're doing some refinement, but it's ready to go. So when reporting, start, reporting part, period starts, in January, that will be a process that will be available to agencies around the state. Another item I wanted to talk to you about, because we've had a lot of questions, I know you have as well. Um, House Bill 3712 passed this last session, and one thing that it required was for T. Cole to specify up to 16 hours of the mandated 40 hours of training that a peace officer is required, required to have every two years. Um, this law states that we will identify up to 16 hours of training prior to the beginning of each new training unit. And that's where we ran into a little bit of a problem because the law didn't become effective until September 1. Uh, but we should have been able, and we were supposed to be able to, if we were going to be able to do it this time, identify what we were going to mandate before September 1, but it didn't become effective until then. So we've been in the conversations with the governor's office, and I think where we're landing on this is we will be identifying up to 16 hours that we are recommending for this training unit uh, be done, uh, that we strongly recommend. This is training that officers need. Uh, this is in preparation for the next training unit, which starts August, or actually September 1 of 23. Uh, agencies can expect the, that there will be, and we will identify those early and get those out so that the training Providers can get ready for that, but they can expect to have some mandated training out of T-Cole for the 23-24 uh, training unit. So, um, but this one, we will identify some stuff. We will get that out to all agencies, the, the training we're recommending this time, but we didn't want to push forward with it this time and have it not fulfill exactly the wording of the law, um, but we didn't want to ignore this very important mandate um, that, that was passed in the last session. So that's where we'll be heading with that. And I understand it's going to change. It can change every training cycle, uh, training unit, because it, of identifiable training issues that we absolutely. have across the state. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's right. correct. That that every training unit prior to the training unit, we will be identifying up to 16 hours that will be mandated as part of the 40 for that next training unit, and it will change every time. Can it be less than 16 hours if if that's all that's identified at that point? That you know, as far as it. Doesn't have to be 16 hours if you, if you identify just a few topics that we need to dis, to train. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. It says up to 16 hours. Okay. So it can't be more than 16, but we'll have to see what's what we feel like is, is important that needs to be trained in that unit, and it'll be up to 16 hours, but it may not be a full 16 hours. Okay, but there thank will you. Be training there. Just to reiterate, um, this training cycle will be recommended hours, and I would be hopeful that our law enforcement agencies and officers would do their best to attain those recommended hours. That is correct. But in future training cycles, per the legislation, the identified training will be mandatory. So this cycle is recommended. Future cycles will be mandatory training, just, just so everyone's on the same page. Yes, ma'am. Um, Thank you. Do we have an idea of what type of training that's being recommended? Or in this case, recommended? Not yet. We, we, uh, we really hit that point that's compromised between making sure we're f satisfying what the law says and doing it correctly, but still coming out with something. And so we've not yet had the opportunity to identify what this time we're recommending. We will be doing that very quickly um, and seeing what's available. One thing I will tell you that we're, we're kind of, we're very committed to, I'm very committed to, is when training is going to be mandated by TCOL, it needs to be accessible. Uh, I taught for many years in rural West Texas for the West Central Texas Council of Governments, and I've, I've taught for small agencies a lot, and I understand how difficult it is for a small agency, training money-wise, staffing-wise, to start sending people if they don't live anywhere near their, their agency's not near a training provider. It's difficult to get that done. So we're committed to the hours that we do mandate um, we're going to, we're not going to mandate them until they are available on our website in an online, online process for free. Now that doesn't preclude doing them in a classroom because uh, I'm, I believe in online training, but I always love a classroom training. I think you have more chance for interaction and it's a stronger training. And whenever we come up with, with these topics, they will be available for training providers to do in a, in a, uh, classroom setting, but we are going to have them available online on our website for free so that the rural areas that have difficulty finding the money and the time to get people trained, I don't want to create a mandate for these smaller agencies that they struggle to try to meet. So um, we're going to ensure that it's, this is doable and we'll, we're going to ensure that it's good, useful topics. Um, but as you said, uh, Chief, it, we're, we're going to need to, this will, in 23, it will be mandated and the same um, non-compliance issues that come into play with the 40 hours will come into play with these hours that will be mandated. So, so this, just to clarify for those that again are, are in the audience and watching, this will be pretty much like our law update that we are required to take every two years. Correct. And then that additional training too. Okay. And, and I'm also, for another statement was made, just to reiterate, um, don't want to do the same thing every time. I mean, there'll be new issues come up and new things that we need training on, of course. and it will change every unit. It's, it's not gonna be having to take the same thing multiple times. We're, 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 we're hopefully we can use this a whole lot better than that. Oh, so. yes. Okay, thank you. Next item that I have, um, you know, I, I was kind of joking, semi-joking with some of y'all yesterday talking about how I, I walked through the office and, and I see somebody that I've never seen before wearing one of our name tags, and I'm like, who is this person? Because we have so many new people. Um, right at the end of the session, the legislature was very gracious uh, in providing for us uh, some um, unbelievable resources, both in the IT section and also in the education services section. So we have been filling the positions that were given to us, um, and I would like to introduce to you now some of the new people that we have uh, some of these are brand new. This first one I'm going to introduce, this is actually her third day with us. So um, uh, I want you to get to know them. I want them to get to know you. And, and uh, we're very, very excited to have these people on board. Some of the things you're already seeing, the things we're doing with TCLEDS, um, and, and the, the bonuses we're going to be able to do there are coming from the fact that we were afforded these resources by the legislature. So we appreciate that. Uh, first in the credentialing division, and and... Folks, when I call your name, please stand up so they can see you and, and see who you are and hopefully get to meet you in the office or here and get to know you. <laughs> Kelly Kirkland uh, comes to, new to our, our credentialing division. Uh, she worked at the Public Utility Commission for 14 years. 
Uh, she has two wonderful kids. Uh, favorite part of being a mom is her grandbabies. I will attest to that. There's nothing like grandbabies. Um, the best in the world. Kelly likes to fish, work on vehicles, barbecue, and cook. Good Texas woman here, sounds like, and we're very, very happy to have her. We really are. Um, from the IT division, some new people. We have Bailey Barksdale join the IT team in October. Bailey has worked in the information technology for over seven years with a focus in desktop user support and network maintenance. Uh, he comes to us from Mississippi where he was part of the uh, IT team at a large grain terminal. His primary duty with TCO will be desktop user support for our staff at headquarters to use uh, help for users of my TCO online training and the TCLED system. I have a, a lot on his plate to work with. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce to you Justin Wofford. Joined the IT team in October of 21. Uh, he was hired to assist in the maintenance and development of the current and new software applications owned and operated by T. Cole. He's from God's country in Abilene, Texas, <laughs> and graduated from the University of North Texas with a Bachelor of Science and the University of Texas at Austin with a full stack in with full stack web development. He and his wife Hannah have been married for five years, live in South Austin with their two dogs. Uh, Jaime Purcell, very excited to get Jaime. He has worked in the IT programming world since 1984 in various industries. Jaime has been the primary TCLEDS database and desktop application programmer for the last 15 years. He helped build TCLEDS working for PCI. So when we're buying TCLEDS from PCI, we stole Jaime over and got him over. He's been married to Alice for 37 years. He has four children, two grandchildren, and another grandchild on the way. Uh, another one that we got from PCI that we're very happy to have, Lance Beamer, has 15 years in software development and testing in a variety of languages and platforms, as well as maintaining servers and network infrastructure for the last 10 years. He's been updating TCLEDS and the TCOL exam, I mean, I'm sorry, exam system, and he created uh, today's My TCOL account system. So uh, we're very happy to have him. He's a Bachelor of Science in Computer Information Systems from the University of Houston at Clear Lake. Moving on to the Education Services Division. Like I said, a bunch of new people, but we're excited. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you Rachel Reinhardt. She is our new Education Services Supervisor. She'll be leading the Education Services team in creating and developing our educational platform. Uh, prior to T. Cole, she was the academic program supervisor with the Texas Department of Public Safety. She worked at their training academy and managed the academic program for all incoming trainees at DPS. Uh, before DPS, she was an instructor in higher education. She taught first year writing to incoming freshmen, uh, help with new officers. She's been in education for the last 10 years as a student educator and mentor. She received her master's degree in liberal arts with a humanities concentration from St. Edwards in Austin. She also has a bachelor's degree in, in business administration from Texas A&M Corpus Christi with an emphasis in marketing and a minor in public relations. Carolyn DeWitt is a testing manager for the education services team. She will design, develop, and publish questions for the licensing exam. She will schedule and proctor licensing exams at headquarters. In addition, she will extract and analyze testing data for quality control patterns and trends prior to Cole. She worked as a crime analyst with the Office of the Attorney General, and before that, she worked over 10 years with Department of Public Safety in the Intelligence Counterterrorism Division as a financial analyst, trainer, and mentor. She received her bachelor's degree in history from Concordia University and a paralegal certification in 2015 from the University of Texas at Austin. Kari Barentine is an instructional designer on the educations team. I'll introduce her to you. She will be creating and updating curriculum as well as updating our online presence. Before, any, before joining T. Cole, Kari was an e-learning coordinator with the Texas Department of Public Safety. I, you see kind of a pattern here, don't you? <laughs> um, I, I'm kind of tickled about that, and, and, I'm, and Jason's not even here for me to give him a hard time about it. Where she designed and developed e-learning courses and provided e-learning technical ex expertise. Prior to DPS, she worked as a level two support specialist in the tech support industry, providing customer support as well as training and mentoring uh, level one support staff. She received her BA bachelor's in German with a minor in international studies from Texas State University. Introduced to you Jackie Pruitt. She will be an instructional designer on education services team. She'll be creating and updating curriculum and other educational materials. Before joining T. Cole, you got it. Jackie was a training <laughs> specialist with the Texas Department of Public Safety. 
where she developed a program of leadership and professional development courses. Prior to DPS, she worked in the banking industry for over a decade, specializing in mergers and acquisitions, assimilation training, uh, in addition to her responsibilities as an assistant vice president, branch manager, and lending officer, ro er, the role she filled there. Jackie a, is a alumnus of Stephen F. Austin University, where she received a BA in fine arts with an emphasis in theater and a minor in political science. Interesting thing about her, after college, she achieved her lifelong goal of working on Broadway, doing special events, developing, and fundraising. Brings a wide variety of things to us. Introduce to you David Guffey, is an instructional designer on the education services team. David worked for us once before when we had the grant positions, and we liked him so much we brought him back. <laughs> He'll be creating and updating curriculum and other education <laughs> materials. Um, he has worked in local school districts as a high school science teacher, a middle school assistant principal, direct district curriculum coordinator, and director of secondary education. David has a bachelor of science in education, uh, secondary education and master's degrees in curriculum and in instruction, biology, and educational administration. And finally, last but not least, Linda Kernahan is an instructional designer on the education services team. She'll be creating and updating curriculum as well as updating our online educational presence. She began her career in high tech at University of Texas at Austin, earning a degree in the computer programming for business system design and development. She worked 10 years with Dell, where she leveraged her technical skills to ensure uh, successful employee adoption of new and upgraded enterprise system information systems. She studied design, in, I'm sorry, instructional design at the Center for Effective Performance in Chicago and through a study program with Austin's Association for Training and Development. Can you tell we're excited about all of these people coming in and, and the possibilities that we have here? So um, once again, I, I want, I'm encouraging them to take a moment to get to know you. I'd like for you to get to know them, and we're very happy to have them on board. Yeah, well, and with first that, and foremost, we want to thank the legislature absolutely. Uh, for the funding I, to, uh, uh, to hire these folks. Um, congratulations. We want to thank each of you for, for choosing uh, to come work for T. Cole. We're, we're excited to have all of you. Uh, welcome. I'm going to ask each of you, though, if, if you're here at the end of this meeting, um, would you please make it a point to come up? We'd all love to meet you, and, and we look forward to getting to know you better. Um, if it's not today, uh, if you have things to do, please don't, you know, please don't feel obligated to wait around. But, but when we're in the office or at one of the future meetings, would you please make it a point to, to come up and introduce yourselves? We would love to, to meet you personally and, and get to know you. But thank you all for, for being here. And, it sounds like uh, sounds like we're in trouble with DPS, uh, <laughs> but but we're glad to we're glad to have you. Thank you. And that's the end of my report. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Anyone have questions? Okay, we will now go to uh, Director. Mike Antu for the Enforcement and Special Services Report. Good morning. Glad to be back at the Pickle Center and I've got a few things to go over today. Uh, one thing I want to let everybody that's out in the audience and um, hopefully watching us on the, the stream is we are prepping the first time pass rate report. Uh, they'll be getting notified at the end of this week to go online and review their, uh, their numbers if they have any uh, conflict with them or any issues that we could uh, talk through a remedy before we publish the, uh, the report. Um, cursory look of it, it looks pretty good. No, uh, no new issues there. Uh, we were a bit concerned because there were some, um, some hiccups with individual academies that were taking the, uh, the new state exam. Um, we worked through those and a lot of uh, providers were able to uh, accomplish a 100% pass rate and, uh, and high pass rates rather quickly with that new exam. So we're excited with the numbers that we got off of that and we'll be publishing that by the end of this year. Yep, Mike, would you, would you, um, you know, you say hiccup. Um, I think that there was, uh, to be very transparent, I think that there was some concern initially uh, with the exam, but y'all did a, a, a good job, um, you know, trying to identify um, you know, the root of, of the lower pass rate. And would you just expand on that? Because we, we, I think it might be beneficial still for some academies or more importantly for some instructors to understand 
that they have to teach to the new curriculum. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to start with, I was, I was making announcements at commission, at the conferences, uh, many years as this was coming, that it, it's, it's coming, a new change, an entire rewrite, and the exam was completely redone. We, we took the old exam away and started from scratch. Uh, we had some academies that um, delivered content that may have been stale from the previous <coughs> uh, curriculum uh, due to either complacency or um, just uh, instructors feeling their confidence in their level to deliver knowledge. What we found were the providers that, that took the new curriculum and the instructor resource guide and taught from that. And some of them even provided that to their students uh, were able to achieve that higher pass rate immediately. Uh, we, we spoke with some academies that that thought it was a little different and that they were able to still convey the same knowledge and the methods that they were using. Um, and they did challenge the numbers and we pulled together the data uh, statewide at first time attempt pass rate for that new exam in the time period that it was out. Uh, the numbers did not show that there was a discrepancy between the state exam and the correct curriculum. So therefore we were able to show that it was a uh, individual academy um, experience where the pass rates were lower than expected and uh, individuals had to acknowledge that this was a new test. Um, the old test had, was not compromised in any way, but people knew where the topic areas that they needed to, uh, to touch on very specifically. Uh, with that said, I think we're at a good point now with the new curriculum and the new state exam where it is at. Uh, we still to this day look at it and are going through it. And now um, as the long introduction of staff, we have an individual that will continue to look at that test bank and keep it up to date. Um, we didn't find any uh, questions that were causing individuals to fail. Um, we had some, we reviewed several on myself, the executive director and director Grissom hand scored and, and went through exams that were in question to find any discrepancies uh, if there were any. So uh, we definitely did our due diligence to make sure this was done fairly. And um, I think we're at the point now where everybody has the message and we have great training and great cadets coming out of our academy. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I think the bottom line is the curriculum changed. And as instructors, we have a tendency to be really comfortable with um, with our material and and uh, uh, teach that way, but we've you know we've got to to really dive into the changes and make sure that we in incorporate the changes into our lesson plans and our teaching. So absolutely. thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So so with that, that will be coming out here shortly. Um, we uh, with the new staff, we we are also looking at what our new support's going to look like. Uh, we currently have. 96,000 MyTCOL users. That's who we currently support as individual officers in their MyTCOL account. Uh, web users for TCLEDS is at 10,974, which as we've talked about, that we're gonna inherit that uh, user base as customer service. Again, we do have staff um, prepared and ready to take that on. But we need to remember that that 10,000 that are currently uh, web users now is going to grow. Uh, because here I want to, to put out, again, as we did in the last one, um, everyone will be getting the uh, My TCO Plus for free when we do complete this acquisition of TCLEDS. I've had a lot of questions of when that's going to happen. Um, if anyone can get me a specific date on that, I would love to hear it. Um, I have later on some dates and times with uh, where we're at in that project. Uh, the bigger question that continues to come up, um, I have to renew next month. Do I have to pay? <laughs> Unfortunately, to maintain that access and that ability, you will have to maintain that contract with Productivity Center until the acquisition is complete. And we can't, there, there's no way around that until we are uh, fully in possession of the product. So we are on the 
my TCO acquisition, we are in the process of waiting for a, um, a demand request from Atos. We are working with uh, Deloitte and Atos and DIR and LBB, several acronyms and stuff. They are working through the legality of this uh, procurement and the security. We have done a vulnerability tests and they are making sure that when the state does purchase it, all our user data is still secure. We are looking at moving to DIR shared services, which will bring another level of security to the TCLED system. Uh, so we're working through all of that at the same time. I think uh, we're getting close to the end, and as we've seen this long process drug out, when we get there, it, it's gonna start running pretty quick. So that's why we already have the, the staff on hand. So when this thing starts rolling quick and we do get it, uh, and the check is made and we own the product and the servers are moved over, uh, that it's gonna be a, a pretty quick transition. I will ask for patience with the, our, our licensing community out there whenever we are trying to spin up new accounts for everybody, that will not be an overnight process. Um, I've asked my team to make it as short as possible and uh, we, will, we will work with that, uh, you know, they always love it when I sit up here and make promises and they're back there writing notes down saying, oh my gosh. But we're <laughs> gonna get there and we're gonna make it happen. So the other project that I have updates on and m many questions on is the secure file transfer. Uh, we are in the um, bidding process for that. Our statement of work is going through all of its steps with uh, DIR approving it and um, that is getting expedited. To, to get out there to the world so individual companies can start bidding on that project. With that said, January 1st is still coming. And the deadline for this system to be in place is still January 1st, regardless of where our statement of work uh, sits in the process. Um, with that, our, uh, our programmer, Justin Wilford, was able to, uh, to come on board with great smiles, get introduced to the team, given a workstation, and give a short timeline for a very big project. Uh, I, I must say he has stepped up. I've seen several demos of what he is building and I, um, I have been told it will be ready for January 1. As, uh, as he sits back there, I'm sure making faces <laughs> at me. <laughs> so our goal is to have instructions and uh, we have two individual, the staff members for that. We, we also got two FTEs for the secure file transfer. Uh, they are in the background process and we hope to have them on board um, so we can start making accounts and getting people in this system uh, quickly. Our instructions have not come out on how to use the system because as he is building it, we are building instructions to give agencies guidance on how to get through this uh, temporary system. In his great forward thinking, he has also built this thing whenever our new system comes online, all this time is not wasted. We are gonna be able to turn this program time into other products, other ticketing systems, and other sharing services that we will need. So, uh, so we, we definitely appreciate their, their, their forward thinking in that process. Any questions on that part? Okay. The Texas Law Enforcement Peer Network is uh, working together with the Carruth Center, BJ Wagner and Meadows out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We had a meeting uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we got to see a demonstration of the app that will be used and um, put out to the state. We've had um, meetings with, with commissioners that have resources that will be able to um, be utilized in this thing. We're working through some of those processes. Uh, the hubs are being identified for the funding hubs and there will be some in-kind hubs. And what the hubs are going to be are gonna be the speaking points around the state that will be able to uh, train individual peers and, and you know, fill the state with, with qualified peers to help individual licensees that are eligible for this service if they are needing help of or crisis. So we are working through that. Um, we are looking for potentially a January uh, launch date, uh, depending on some programming issues and where they're at. 
There is no specific deadline for this uh, product to be launched. So we are definitely looking at quality and, and stability versus uh, expedience. So we definitely want to make sure all the individuals out there are provided a, a good product. Mike, this is an incredible opportunity and resource for our law enforcement uh, folks throughout the state. Um, would you speak for just a moment on the emphasis, focus, and importance on the confidentiality component of that because we want our folks to utilize this resource but also feel safe in doing so. Yes, ma'am. The, the, goal, the goal of this system will be to allow an individual uh, that just needs to talk or is embattled in, in a crisis to through an application or the use of a, a phone number to be able to get into contact with a peer that has been trained to listen um, and work with and meet with these individuals to work through that crisis. And the goal is to, if you wish to share your information and whoever you reach out to on the other end, uh, you feel comfortable enough to share your name and, and where you are at and that is totally up to the individual seeking the assistance. The goal of the application is uh, anonymity uh, for the peer and for the individual seeking peer assistance. So that's what we're working through now uh, because the, the hurdle is how do you connect people without knowing who you're connected to? So we're working on getting the peer group established through the hubs and get them trained and identified and loaded into this application and, and be available through a potential phone number to get um, help. But the goal is that anybody seeking help, if I am in the Austin area, and, and I really want to seek help, I just don't want to talk to anybody close by. Because you may go to a scene with them. You may work with them. You, you, you don't know. To make the app to where I can seek a peer in the northern part of the panhandle, and then I can talk as freely as I want. Now, if you're fine, you can find a peer in your local area. Uh, but again, the emphasis is on uh, anonymity. Thank you. Ma'am, if I could real quick, I really need to speak up and, and acknowledge the Houston Police Department. Uh, Houston's already been doing a lot of amazing work in this, in this arena. Um, and, and one of the more integral parts, the critical parts needed for all this, Houston has stepped up. Houston PD has stepped up and offered their assistance with it uh, through their system and, and helping make that work. I want to make sure that we acknowledge that, that the Houston Police Department's gone way above and beyond trying to help make this thing come together and how much we appreciate that. Well, I know uh, Commissioner Burris and Commissioner Whitaker both have um, a lot of experience and passion in, in helping uh, uh, our officers. And, um, you know, I want to thank them and the other partners. We've, you know, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of folks um, that recognize the need and that are stepping up and um, eager to help. Yes, yeah, so we, we definitely think their, uh, their input and their resources they're bringing to the table. Question on that. The, the next part we have that's going to be available in all licensees, uh, more so for academies that they'll pass on to their licensees in our in our endeavor to get licensees to be self-sufficient or, or more sustaining of their own information, uh, what is traditionally known as the punch card, which is your initial license you receive after uh, completing the licensing course and uh, successfully passing the state exam. Uh, currently, this is a manual process. When that happens, uh, our print queue gets a, a list of people overnight. We print out this punch card uh, we stuff it in an envelope, we put some cardboard on, under it so it doesn't bend, we, we put postage on it and labels, and we send it out to agencies so the individuals can have their license. Uh, again, with the IT team, they said, well, why can't we put this in the MIT call account? And I said, great, make it happen. And they did. So um, we're looking for a mid to late December go live where your punch card will be available through your MyTCOL account, uh, where you can print it, cut it out, it will look exactly the same. The only difference is it won't have the, uh, 
self-laminating, folding over plastics and all that good stuff. But because all of our licensees want to make sure that they can help and save money for the great state of Texas, <laughs> I know we will not have any complaints <laughs> from individual licensees having to do this on their own. So uh, that is something that will be coming out in December, and this also will push people to get their MyTico account. Uh, because as we grow more and more stuff, more information uh, is going to come through the MyTico account, and that's really where we want the licensees to go first uh, as we start putting more information into that uh, system. All right. The other thing I get a bunch of questions on is the shopping cart because licensees want to do their work and pay for stuff online. Um, our programmers are working on that. I have here that that will also be a mid to late December launch. Uh, we have done, I've seen the transactions, uh, all kinds of technical talk tokens and security transactions are happening with the texas.gov application and um, it's there. We'll be able to get folks to be able to purchase stuff again online and we definitely want to sell it to them. So we've got more online training. I will leave that um, with Director Grissom. He's, uh, his team has started and will continue to develop more, more items in our catalog. Um, again, with the racial profiling, I think uh, Deputy Director Vickers gave a good uh, opening on that. I, only thing I want to add, we've had several questions. We've sent out our first reminder of racial profiling is due. Um, you cannot report the 2021 racial profiling till the end of 2021. <laughs> so that, that reporting will start January 1. It will be open and ready and with all these new features um, because I know now if it does not happen, um, my phone will be ringing up. Well, actually, I'll just turn it off. But anyway, <laughs> it's going to work. It's there, and uh, I'm glad to hear what we've got. Noncompliance, I believe, is my uh, I have two more things. Noncompliance is in the last stage of uh, the vetting through the credentialing department. Um, they are prepping the individual licensees letter, licensee letters now. Uh, the individuals should be expecting letters with their notification letter and the options that they are going to do to remedy their non-compliant status. They have either already have taken the training, they are in the process or are going to take the training once we have notified them, or their chief administrators did not give them the opportunity to take that training. And if option three is, is selected, they will have, we will work with them, get some statements and work through that process. If that is the, uh, the option they are invoking. And the last thing I've got is the um, mass communications, which we're again excited. This will be um, in the MyT Goal account on our website for licensees to be able to subscribe to. Um, that is phase two, but they'll eventually be able to subscribe to areas of interest that they want to hear communications from. Uh, we will use this not to spam everybody. We will give pertinent and important information through this system to the group specifically on a more regular basis uh, so people can hear what they need to hear from us. Uh, Mike, would you give a little background on that? Because I, I, I think that's probably one of the main questions I get is, mm -hmm. you know, how come T-Cole doesn't send this information out. So there's been some changes, some very welcome changes. So yes. So, so before we, uh, we had our exchange servers and we managed all of that stuff. And for us to send out email blasts to all 2,700 agencies or all 100 and so thousand licensees, we would have to break those up into segments of 100 to 150 and work through those each time through an email account, no reply that we've built, and it is very cumbersome. And when you do it that way, a lot of the receivers get spam, goes to their junk folder. It, it doesn't work. It's very unreliable, um, but we've made it work. We have, we have gotten the information to who we try to get it to, uh, but it's not the most efficient way. So we started about a year ago looking at a, a system that will allow us to reach out to our licensees and have our licensees subscribe to us if they want to hear from us about certain topics. Uh, this system will allow us to make customizable emails 
eventually this is how you'll get your non-compliance notification. Uh, again, and I'll throw a plug out there right now, this is why you need to keep uh, email addresses. Use a personal email address in your MyKiko account because that license is your personal license. Because if you use an agency address, every time you leave and you don't update it, you're not gonna get notified. So it's always best to have that communication coming to you. Um, we will also have text capabilities with this one and that was the bigger push because who doesn't have a cell phone in their pocket? And with that capability, uh, we think we're gonna be able to reach out to, to many more licensees more efficiently. Yeah. Well, I think many of us take for granted. Uh, yes. I mean, th that you know, we either have the capability at our agencies or we certainly uh, know that others have the capability of, uh, of doing mass emails. And um, you know, when I've personally explained to folks, um, they're, they understand um, but they're also, you know, have been astounded that, that T. Cole has not in the past had this capability. So this is pretty exciting news exciting. Um, for everyone. And I think this is, um, you know, as we work to improve connectivity and communication um, and, and such that this will be a huge um, tool that we'll be able to use um, to get information out to folks. So pretty exciting. Yes, and thanks expert. to you and your team for very exciting. Um, the last item, we did a TCLED survey, which we thought was going to come back. We wanted to know what is our baseline of where we're gonna be when we take over this product. Um, we, it was all anonymous. Uh, we had 540 so uh, respondents to this, 546 actually, uh, respondents to this survey. And overwhelmingly, uh, the results were positive. There were some areas in, that we are gonna work on that we've identified uh, some training. A lot of people want training in how to operate this system. So we are working to develop some training, uh, move some items around. I, I went through all the open text anonymous comments that they made about it. Um, some of them rather funny, some of them very, very viable and gave us some direction. So we are going to, I want everyone to know if you responded to this survey, we, we listened, we we're gonna be making some changes and we'll be using the mass communications to let people know when changes come to the TCLEDS application. With that said, I, uh, I am open for any questions. Questions, comments? Hmm? Oh. Thank you very much, sir. We are going to go to Director Grissom for credentialing and field services report. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, as Director Vickers uh, stated, we've got a, a large growth in the new education services area. Uh, just to kind of uh, round out what that looks like, there's a supervisor for professional instructional designers, uh, a testing manager for state licensing exams, and a research specialist is what those, those employees represent. Um, that, that gives us a capability we have not had in, in a long, long time uh, at the commission. Uh, it also allows us to change kind of the paradigm in how we're building curriculum. Uh, historically, we've used uh, you know, long-suffering volunteers on committees, but the committee members actually had to write most of the content. And, and then uh, the staffing in Austin, generally Susan, <laughs> uh, had to assimilate that all into one voice with multiple authors and everything else. Uh, this allows us to move to kind of a different design paradigm where we'll be uh, using the same committees. We still need the expertise, we still need the subject matter expert volunteers from the state of Texas, and we will certainly engage those, and I encourage people to, to volunteer for those things, uh, because our curriculum needs to reflect the industry that, that it's going to be trained out to. Uh, but if, if some people have been a little reticent to uh, volunteer for a committee because it used to be a really significant burden for some people if you were given a chunk of something to write. 
or they felt like they had the expertise but not the authorship skills. Uh, we, the commission, now have the authorship skills and, and the professional design skills in-house. So we'll be able to use probably a better term is focus group. So everybody's voice gets heard. Uh, and then we will be identifying subject matter experts for our instructional designers to work very closely with. So we're kind of changing the, the curriculum development paradigm uh, thanks to the added resources that the state has given us. Um, some current projects, uh, as the executive director pointed out, House Bill 3712 uh, required additional hours of training to the basic peace officer course, the addition of 24 hours for a total uh, minimum number of hours of 720. Uh, we, since the launch of the latest BPOC curriculum, we've gathered data, we've gathered input from academies as they actualize the curriculum out in the field. Um, we've impaneled a focus group specifically to this task recently. Uh, we worked with <coughs> groups to include the Governor's Sexual Assault Task Force and other external organizations with an interest in what the Basic Peace Officer course looks like. And so we will be adding the required 24 hours to the BPOC. Uh, real quickly, it'll include uh, additions to Code of Criminal Procedure, uh, the Missing and Exploited Children, uh, sexual assault and family violence, uh, use of force, and health and safety code. Those are the areas uh, that, that will see some revision and expansion. Uh, while we have it open, we'll be making the updates to uh, brought about by the 87th legislative session, penal code updates. Uh, a lot of those don't necessarily change the content and the objectives because if it says stuttered study chapter 33 of the penal code if a new statutes inserted in chapter 33 that's incumbent in in that objective so it doesn't always mean things will change when they change the penal code but sometimes it does uh, one of the questions that we're already getting is when is this going to happen uh, the legislation requires us to publish January 1, and the go live date, uh, as uh, expressed in the legislation, is any officer trained that starts training after July 1st of next year will have to be taught on the new curriculum, 720-hour minimum. So just as we talked about previously, uh, as Director Antu talked about, the, the, some of these things are going to change. Academies are going to have to change the way they, they do business, at least in these topic updates. The uh, uh, question comes up, if you publish it January 1, can I implement the changes prior to July 1st? Yes, is the answer. Once they are published, you, uh, an academy could proactively implement uh, the new curriculum. Uh, there is a domino effect anytime we touch the BPOC or amend it to the testing. Okay, so what happens, uh, and this question's come up recently, the, uh, when we open up the BPOC and make changes or the legislature changes the statutes, that has a potential to change the test. Uh, the state licensing exams. So when w what we do is we go in and make sure that we have no questions that are contrary to the new law. So we pull them out, we turn them off. So there's no penalty to someone who is trained in either the old or the new. Now the new questions, uh, the new legal changes will not be implemented in the question database until the new curriculum goes live in July, so we, and there will actually be a time frame after that. So we'll try and keep people apprised. So if you're training the state curriculum, uh, I do want to uh, remind academies that they are obligated to teach the legal changes. When the legislature changes it, whether T. Cole 
immediately turns around and gets an objective in the basic academy or any other in-service training course, uh, if you read the first page of the abstract, it says if new, better information is available or there's a legal change, the trainer's obligated to make those changes in their training. So sometimes the, the state moves faster, the landscape changes faster than we can change the curriculum. So that, that's still uh, incumbent on the trainers to make those changes. I'd Have certainly entertain any questions about the BPOC. Well, I just wanted to uh, thank you for explaining that because that is something that does come up when the BPOC changes. We always have those, well, is the test gonna be over the old stuff? Is it gonna be over the new stuff? And uh, I really appreciate you explaining that to the to the st uh, staff and or to the individuals in here and also on our live feed so they understand it doesn't go in effect until the actual new curriculum is put in there. We do our best to make sure there's, there's not a penalty to the test taker. So if, if something is in question, we, we would remove that. We've got a robust enough database that, that we can remove questions from testing. And so that's our first solution to those changes. So we, we try never to penalize the student or the test taker uh, in that situation. Uh, we're currently working on the mental health officer revision. Uh, that, that's been a, a hot topic off and on uh, with the uh, expansion of the crisis intervention training to 40 hours in the new curriculum. It certainly exceeded both in content and scope uh, what it used to do and impacts the, uh, the usefulness of our old mental health course. So we, we've uh, had a focus group m meet and work out a plan for revision with our instructional staff. Uh, emphasis on the mental health officer course is the legal elements about acting as an MHO, all of the legal processes. So there's, there's more of a function in that, but it will also build on the skills uh, learned in the CIT training. So there will be an additional uh, information on crisis intervention. Uh, we will look for public comment in January, and we expect a launch in February of the new mental health officer course. Uh, uh, one of the legislative requirements uh, upon us and uh, our licensees was the CPR telecommunicator course, or telecommunicator CPR course uh, that came out of this last legislative session. We've had a focus group meet uh, for a design plan. Uh, part of the requirement, we're going to recognize either American Heart Association or American Red Cross CPRs. It will be part of the, the training, uh, will be the requirement to get hands-on CPR certification as, as part of the training component. Um, the remainder of the course will be uh, telecommunicator assisted CPR. When is, when is you know, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest and, and, and you know, how do we help identify that? When is CPR appropriate? How do we work people in that situation through it remotely as telecommunicators? Um, again, we hope to have it out for public comment in January with the go live date of February. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the bill, this bill adds a burden of uh, retraining to uh, compliance requirements for telecommunicators. This, this, this course is going to be uh, uh, redone every two years, or the, the requirement is to retrain every two years, it's more appropriate to say. Um, the, the course also changes the basic licensing requirements, the basic training course. So once we get the in-service version of it, uh, we will be adding or manipulating at least the uh, basic telecommunicator course. Uh, we, we've had some interest expressed in maybe being able to fit this component into the existing time frame and might not have to extend it, but uh, there's more to follow. We'll have to, to, to look at that and, and see if there are some 
time savings we can do in some delivery of the telecommunicator to insert this material. And I appreciate that. I know as I was one of the ones that was asking or talking about that uh, yesterday about if we could any way could work it into the two weeks um, because we, it is a burden that a lot of agencies have in sending telecommunicators for two weeks for the class. And now if we had another whole full day. So I appreciate you uh, working on that and seeing if that could be a possibility. Uh, yeah. We've heard that issue and we will certainly take it into consideration as, as we work on the design. And uh, we've, we've had uh, good input from external sources on what the constraints are of you know, chiefs and sheriffs and, and, and their issues with getting people through the training events uh, and, and making them available. Uh, any other questions on? I do have one question about that, and I know that we do have um, the telecommunicator licensing course uh, available online. Have y'all looked at yet on how that's going to work with them actually doing a hands-on CPR? You can't do that online. So I didn't know if that was something that you have entertained yet or are aware of uh, with that basic licensing. Commissioner, one of the uh options that we're looking at is requiring the, the CPR certification, the hands-on CPR certification prior to, so if, if we had an online provider that, that had that course, uh, part of their enrollment standard would be that the, the student would have to prove completion of the, the okay. CPR. Uh, okay. Now we, we still need to review uh, the telecommunicator assisted section to make sure that it lends itself to online delivery mm -hmm. so we're, we're, okay. we're still we're, we're cognizant of that and uh, uh, we've had several chief administrators express their desire to continue to use online mm -hmm. training and licensing uh, telecommunicators so uh, I, I think we I, I don't know enough to make a call on that but that's certainly something that education services is looking at uh, is as long as it's viable to be delivered online, I think a way to solve that is to require the, the hands-on CPR certification for enrollment in the basics. Okay. Because, I, I have uh, several. The hands-on CPR is pretty readily available. Mm -hmm. Even in rural areas, most mm -hmm. of the time, your volunteer fire department can do the CPR course. So I have several in my region that, that do, they have to do the online, so I, I know they've questioned me about how do they do CPR online, so. I, I think we probably have a solution. Okay. But, uh. Okay, uh, one of the other tasks we've been given by the legislature this session is the salary survey for Texas peace officers. It's a legislatively required report to the governor, lieutenant governor, and speaker of the house prior to the beginning of next session. Um, it, to detail peace officer pay and cost of living, both comparison across Texas, but also comparison with other states. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. Uh, I would like to put the community on notice that we will be sending out an email invitation to chief administrators to take part in the survey. Uh, we, we, we would ask that, that you respond to that or have your appropriate staff respond to that survey uh, to help us collect the data. We hope to have that survey out before Christmas uh, this year. And uh, we've already worked uh, on the out-of-state portion of the survey uh, via our executive director's contacts with the IATALYST uh, director's organization. Uh, we've gotten 598 responses from 14 states, so we're, we're working on the out-of-state data. Uh, that is a, a in progress. Uh, in, in credentialing, we do have a new process that we're making available. We've had several, several inquiries from people with former service time in the United States military is military police, uh, that specific occupation or series of occupation codes. Uh, we have the F-8 process where we convert military service 
to training hours. So we're giving veterans credit for the training hours uh, for their military service, regardless of occupation. You know, cooks, infantry, uh, EOD, uh, that, that everybody has that option. But we, we are going to be treating military police, people in those specific occupations, uh, the same way we treat out of state and federal transfers to licensure in Texas. So for that military police time, uh, they can apply for and receive year for year service time as service time, not training hours. So that's a separate and distinct process uh, from the military service conversion to training hours. And it's unique to a series of MOS or AFSCs uh, depending on their branch of service. And, and so there's a downloadable form on the website. Uh, if anybody has any questions about that, we'll be happy to handle questions through credentialing on that process if anybody needs help. Uh, some of the things we're, we're Dealing with so far, uh, there's been a great interest in the number of out-of-state federal license that we process. Uh, first quarter year to date, uh, we've approved 129 uh, out-of-state uh, licensees, uh, or approved them to take the state challenge state licensing exam after completing our uh, training. Uh, we've rejected 32. Um, the most common reason for rejection is a lack of minimum training required in the state that they're trying to apply from. Uh, some states have much lower standards than Texas, so they don't meet our standards for incoming. Uh, doesn't mean they can't go to an academy, and get a Texas license. They just can't challenge uh, the exam. Uh, military requests, uh, same thing for military licensure. Uh, we, we processed 19 of those and rejected two. Um, as Director Antu said, training noncompliance, uh, we ended the year, I'm, I'm happy to say, across all three licenses, across all the licensees with 2,413 people uh, in noncompliance, which is uh, in line with what we would see in a normal year or a normal unit. But... Uh, with the intervention of COVID and all the, the questionable things that happened during that period, I, I, I think the community stepped up, you know, we, we tried to do our best from the agency side on notifications and uh, communication, but uh, the licensed community uh, held their ground, did their training, so noncompliance is actually normalized for what we would normally be seeing. So uh, we're happy about that. Uh, that's all I have, uh, unless someone has questions for me. Okay. Questions, comments? Thank you very much, sir. We are going to go to our government relations director, uh, Director Grigsby, and it was kind of shocking to 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 realize that uh, we'll be back in session <laughs> in not too long. <laughs> Before we know it, yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning again, commissioners. Uh, as Chief Lamo mentioned, there is a legislative cycle which starts with the legislative session. Then for state agencies, it goes into the implementation phase, which of course we're currently in for uh, several of the projects that my colleagues have already outlined here today that I won't belabor further. Uh, and then the next step is preparation for the next session. Uh, so we are rapidly transitioning to that phase. Uh, one of the remaining items, this, this piece of legislation has come up a couple of times already today, but House Bill 3712 uh, did several things that we've already talked about. One of the things that we haven't discussed yet today uh, is it set forth several policies that we are to create model policies for, and much of that does stem from um, last summer's uh, unrest following the death of George Floyd uh, and a lot of the policing efforts that have come about since then. So for a duty to intervene in the situation of excessive force and to report that excessive force, um, duty to render aid, 
to someone who is experiencing any sort of injury. Uh, and then uh, there's, there's three or four different model policies that we're going to be coming forth with. Uh, we had a meeting uh, before, right before Thanksgiving uh, that our friends over at Lemit were gracious enough to host. The bill charges us with working with Lemit uh, on those model policies, but we felt it necessary uh, and important to bring in some other stakeholders. And so the Justices of the Peace and Constables Association, Sheriff's Association, and Texas Police Chiefs Association all sent representatives to that meeting so that they could have input in this process as we develop those model policies that we anticipate will be published here uh, before too long. We've come a really long way in developing those model policies. Uh, I don't think any of them will reinvent the wheel from what many agencies already have in place. Um, and uh, we look forward to publishing those here within the next couple of weeks. I think it's realistic to say that we'll have them published by January 1st. Uh, so I wanted to uh, thank our partners in their participation for that. Uh, we are transitioning to the preparation phase, as I mentioned. Uh, we're starting to talk about legislation internally that we may be requesting, as well as appropriations items that we're going to need uh, to implement those and to do our job more efficiently. Uh, and of course, preparing for the kickoff of our limited scope sunset review that will begin in April. I believe I mentioned at our September meeting that we are going to be assigned largely the same team from the Sunset staff uh, to conduct this limited scope review. So we're, we're excited to work with them again, uh, and it makes it very efficient because they've already been up to speed on what the Commission's operations are. It's not going to be anything new to them, and I think we'll really be able to meaningfully show progress on the recommendations that they had had the last time. Uh, so going into the next legislative session. As I mentioned, that begins in April, so we anticipate that uh, and look forward to that. Uh, we have been working with, uh, I am our agency's designee on the Texas <coughs> Sexual Assault Survivors Task Force. That is a project of the Office of the Governor that has uh, several different statutory representatives and we brought in many other stakeholders for that as well. Uh, one of their charges by statute is reviewing law enforcement training uh, and looking at how law enforcement can be better equipped to uh, provide a trauma-informed response to sexual assaults, starting with the officer who is first on scene whenever that report happens and going all the way through um, your more seasoned investigators, detectives, uh, and up to the chief's level uh, and how we can better equip our law enforcement partners uh, to respond to those that that supports those survivors. Uh, they've made several recommendations on some tweaks that we can incorporate into the BPOC. And then we, of course, have the Trauma-Informed Response to Sexual Assault course, uh, both in an online format through my TCOL and in the in-person course that's available uh, to be taught. And so we're, we're working through looking at what those recommendations are and working with education services to see how we can can best provide those. Um, so that that's one of the projects that we've been working on, uh, and I think we'll see some good changes in the future that help support our our law enforcement and our survivors. Uh, some of the other projects that are going on within government relations, kind of more of our recognitions program. Uh, of course, our Peace Officers Memorial. You heard the names uh, that were read today that will be taken up at the event in May that will be taking place May 1st on the Capitol grounds. Uh, and the Peace Officers Memorial Committee has been working hard getting ready for that. Um, I wanted to kind of give you an idea. So there are 68 COVID deaths that are pending from last year. Um, as I mentioned, those undergo a review by ERS uh, and they approve the approve or don't approve the death benefits for the families there, and that determination is used to uh, approve them for the Peace Officers Memorial Monument. Uh, this year, for 2021, there have been 103 total nominations received, 19 of those have been approved, 10 of which are COVID deaths, and then nine others. So uh, as we work through those COVID deaths, 
the ceremonies uh, sadly will be longer than hopefully they will be in future years just based on those COVID deaths. Uh, I think it's safe to say it's impacted everybody across the globe in different <coughs> ways, but certainly our law enforcement uh, as essential personnel have really been impacted significantly. Um, some of the things that we also work on, of course, are flag requests. And I know uh, that's one of the things that we've requested in previous legislative sessions is some funding for those flags for deceased peace officers. So not just line of duty deaths are eligible, but any honorably retired or active officer at the time of their death is eligible, their next of kin is eligible for one of those flags. Um, you know, we continue to seek uh, best ways that we can fund that project as uh, has been mentioned and will be mentioned in the future, whether we seek legislative appropriations for that or uh, another source of funding. Uh, last year in fiscal year 2021, there were 177 requests already in fiscal year 22, which began September 1st. We've received 86 requests. So as you can see, we're, we're really gonna have to look strongly at what funding sources we can uh, identify to support that program. Uh, those are accompanied along with a letter of condolence from the governor and from the executive director of the commission. So uh, that package traditionally comes together. We do have uh, a couple of requests that come through where they would like that flag for the funeral itself. Uh, it is a coffin sized flag. Uh, that's flown over the Capitol. So uh, there are instances, our field service agents have been great in supporting that where we can get that quick response out to the officer's funeral uh, so that the family can have that immediately. Uh, most of the time though, they are shipped as a package together along with those letters that I mentioned. Uh, but you know, that's the status of that program. and We'll continue to see ways that we can do that efficiently and support the families who are missing their loved ones. Um, the final thing that I have is I would like to put a plug in for the Law Enforcement Achievement Awards. Uh, that's a program that we've had for many, many years, and we've had ups and downs on the nominations that we've received. Uh, we have not had a ceremony for the previous two years. We didn't have one in 2020, of course, in the heart of COVID. Uh, we were unable to have it again in 2021 because of the Capitol grounds being open for limited events at that time. So next year in 2022, we do plan to have that ceremony. Uh, and I wanted to put a plug out there for officers who are eligible to nominate any licensee. It doesn't have to be the chief of an agency to make that nomination. It can be done by anyone uh, licensed by the commission or any elected official. So if you, anybody listening here today, if you know of an officer who is uh, worthy of a, an award in the areas of professional achievement, public service, or valor. We want to hear about them and we want to honor them. We're going to be sending out an email using that email blast system that Director Antu spoke of uh, to try to get those nominations in. And you have officially until the end of the year, uh, unofficially we will accept them within a couple weeks after that. So uh, the rule does say by <coughs> December 31st, but I think it's safe to say we can allow a little bit of leeway there with the holidays and everything like that. So uh, if you were aware of a nomination that's worthy, please, by all means, we would love to see them and would love to honor them uh, in June next year. That concludes my report, unless there are any questions that you all have. As far as the flag fund, um, just to reiterate some that may not know, anybody can donate, correct? Yes. If, yes. if someone is looking for Absolutely. making donations, they can contact you all and, Absolutely. and donate. We would love to receive what, that. what is the cost per occurrence? So the flag itself, uh, we pay about $45 for the flag. Um, you know, we've explored some different options on maybe different sources that we can identify for that. Um, but that's generally the cost. And then there's, uh, I believe it's about 10 to $15 for the, the case that it comes in. There's a, a zipper or triangle case so that it, it's protected during transit. Um, and then of course, minimal cost for printing for those letters. And each of those flags has flown over the Capitol. So I'm, she may have mentioned that, but so that they know when those flags are awarded to the family of that deceased officer, 
Uh, it is a flag that has been flown over the Texas Capitol and represents the state. Thank you, ma'am. And last but not least, we have uh, Director Roth with uh, your finance report. Good morning, commissioners. I will be brief. Um, you have in your packet the normal financial report, including expenditures and revenue. In addition, in addition to that this time, there are also samples of uh, human resources, general ledger, revenue ledger, and interface control reports. So far this fiscal year, you've, you've met a lot of our great new team members. Uh, we have filled 15 of the 16 available new positions. We also have in the financial operations arena two active grants. Our curriculum update grant is approximately 80% complete. Our school marshal training grant is 30% complete. Since our last commission meeting, we have completed an annual financial report, annual hub reports, uh, space programming analysis, border security reporting, and an operating budget. And as uh, my colleagues have, have also said, we are preparing for sunset and the strategic fiscal review as well as working on the purchase of the TCLED system and continuing to get the MyTCOL online payment system up and running. We have also uh, come to an agreement on additional office space right down the hall from our, our current offices. Uh, and we're hopeful, I believe their move out is currently occupied is sometime in January. So we hope to occupy that space, hopefully around the time of uh, next commission meeting or so. And of course, we're, we're in the finance area working with implementing the legislative changes you've, you've heard uh, this morning. And we're also gearing up for the agency strategic plan. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions or comments? Okay, we are finished with the reports and um, the executive director Vickers and, and really all of your team. Um, wow. <laughs> Have an amazing team. What wow. can I say? Um, I'm a blessed man. Just, I mean, when you, you know, when you think that we met three short months ago and, and to hear everything that's been accomplished in, in three months is, um, is very impressive. So thanks to all of you for a, a great job, but also all of the work. Um, and I know that uh, all of you that are new, you can, you can understand <laughs> how grateful everyone is to have you here. So again, welcome. So um, moving on, uh, we are going to table agenda item six. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Do we have a motion um, on any of the reports? I motion that we approve the executive director's report and staff's report. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. So we are going to table agenda item number six to the February meeting. So we'll be discussing and taking action on the proposed uh, orders of amendments to the rules in February. So that leads us into Agenda item seven, which is the discussion of and taking action on proceedings for revocation, suspension, and other disciplinary actions. And we are uh, grateful to have with us uh, from the Office of the Attorney General, Mr. Raymond Winter. So thank you, sir. And thank you personally for being available to us yesterday. I know you were pulling double duty and, and uh, appreciate your availability yesterday. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, the first uh, block of matters on your agenda in the disciplinary area are default suspension orders. Each of these individuals listed uh, either uh, committed uh, criminal misconduct or otherwise violated commission rules, subjecting them to proceedings instituted by the executive director to suspend their licenses. Uh, all of these individuals failed to respond to notice of the executive director's enforcement proceedings and now are consequently are subject to the uh, 
institution by the commission of default orders suspending their licenses and the executive director does recommend that each of these default orders be entered in the matter of carlos a escobar in the matter of lois l garner in the matter of omario d gatherite in the matter of mirabel perez placentia and in the matter of kenneth d wadsworth and we're available if you have any questions about any of these individual cases. Any questions from the commissioners? Do we have a motion? I move that the commission accepts and adopt the recommendations of the executive director to enter a default final order to suspend the license of the individuals identified by Mr. Winters. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Mr. Winter. Commissioners, the next individual uh, committed misconduct in violation of commission rules, subjecting himself to institution of proceedings to suspend his license. He did uh, agree to the uh, recommended sanction proposed by the executive director, and consequently do we do recommend uh, at this time that the commission accept and enter the agreed suspension order in the matter of Henry G. Kellogg. Okay. Any questions? Do we have a motion? I move that the commission accept and adopt the recommendations of the executive director to enter a final agreed suspension waiver for Mr. Henry Kellogg. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Commissioners, the next individual on your list uh, committed misconduct, violation of commission rules, subjecting himself to the institution of proceedings by the executive director to revoke his license. Uh, this individual failed to respond to the notice of the enforcement proceedings and is now consequently subject to a default order revoking his license. And we do recommend that that be entered and approved by the commission in the matter of Caleb L. Pilkington. Any questions? Okay. Do we have a motion? Commissioners, I move that the commission accept and adopt the recommendation of the executive director to enter a default final order to revoke the license of Mr. Caleb Pickleton. Pickleton, excuse me. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Commissioners, the next uh, four individuals for your consideration are all individuals who received licenses issued by the commission. In this case, they're all jailers or, or were re in receipt of jailer licenses. Uh, subsequent to the receipt of the license, uh, the executive director discovered information indicating that, that these individuals were not eligible for the license at the time it was received and consequently instituted proceedings to cancel the licenses. When we do that, the respondent has an opportunity to contest the cancellation proceedings. In these cases, all of these individuals fail to respond to the notice of the institution of the cancellation proceedings. Consequently, we now, they've forfeited the right to a contested case hearing, and we now ask the commission enter the orders canceling the licenses of these individuals. So these are the cases of Refuria, uh, C. Carrion, Randy R. Castillo, Letharian D. Jones, and Inez N. Streeter. Any questions? Okay. Do we have a motion? I move that the commission accept and adopt the recommendations of the executive director to enter a final default cancellation order for the names as provided by Mr. Winter. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Mr. Winter. Commissioners, the remaining individuals listed on your agenda uh, uh, are all information items only. Uh, there are individuals who receive statutory suspensions, or at least one individual uh, under by operation of law an individual who received a deferred adjudication for a felony offense, 
is the subject to an immediate statutory suspension without going through uh, a SOA proceeding. Uh, there is one individual who has agreed to surrender his license for a specified term, uh, and if that individual ever wished to go back into law enforcement, would have to start from scratch and go back to an academy. Uh, there are a number of individuals you can see on your list who have agreed to permanent surrenders of their peace officer and or jailer licenses. And then finally, there are reprimands that have been issued by the executive director for administrative violations for failing to report uh, minor rule violations or arrests, things of that nature, that resulted in reprimands. And we're available if you have any questions about any of these matters. But they're for information only and no action is required. Any questions? Okay. Um, we have received um, one person that has uh, requested, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we're moving to agenda item number eight for public comment. We have one person that has uh, requested to address the commission is Theo Whalen here. Absolutely. Good did morning. I pronounce your name correctly? Sure. Yes, you did. It's Waylon. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Commissioners, my name is Thea Waylon. I'm the executive director of the Texas Justice Court Training Center. The last uh, session that we were in, not the current one, but the one prior to, there was the statutory requirement enforced that the elected constables now take a 20-hour civil process education course. Previously, there was not a requirement for the constables to take that, the elected, just the deputies. And we were tasked by T. Cole to be the sole provider for those elected constables, and I wanted to give you all an update on how that has gone over these past two years. Um, briefly, we were very delighted and excited to start off that training session. Constable Hood was there in February 2020. Mm -hmm. As we all know what happened that next <laughs> month, just a small global pandemic. We did regroup and were able to then, over the last year and a couple months, educate 870 constables and their deputies. We provided both online and in-person education. We also made sure that we went around the state. We went deep into East Texas and West Texas, which we had promised uh, Mr. Vickers when we had taken on this task. And we feel very confident with our plan going forward. We have a four-year plan that we have publicized to all of the constables and their offices so that they know where we will be around the state. We have also created a separate clerk constable program so that we would, can open up those additional slots to more elected officials. And we've also separated out a newly elected constable civil process 20 hour. That way the folks who are new to this process, as I know it can be quite daunting to shift from criminal only to learning all of the civil roles, we wanted to make sure that we gave them a targeted program that was meant for them earlier on in their tenure so that they could get more familiar with those procedures early on. So if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you so much for your work. You. And, um, you know, thanks to you and all of our training providers uh, for adapting. Um, I don't think anyone um, could even imagine that we would be, you know, here uh, in the middle of a, of, of a global pandemic. And, um, People move so quickly um, to adapt so that we can continue providing uh, the much needed training to our folks. So thanks to, to you and all of our agencies and training providers for doing that. And we appreciate the work that you're doing. Of course. And thank thanks. you for the update. And we are going to move to agenda item number nine, which is executive session, and we will not be going into executive session today. So we are now at agenda item number 11, and do we have a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> I second. We have a motion and a second. <clears throat> Before we vote, I want to thank you again for, for being here and... Um, 
I think in the opening comments, I uh, said so hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. So closing, quick closing comments. Um, hope you have a great uh, Christmas holiday season. So we will, <laughs> we will go to the, we'll go to the vote. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Same sign. <laughs> we are adjourned, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here today. <laughs>